So I want to start out by talking about um, managing comedians and playwrights in addition to screenwriters. I know several of you guys have a roster that includes playwrights and comedians and television writers, uh, Jack specifically, or Brian specifically. Can you talk a little bit about that crossover and how you work with those kinds of writers? You crossover Comedians, comedians going, that want to go into television. I mean, so the majority of my clients, I, I was I was originally an agent at, at uh, William Morris, and I became a manager as a girl stand AGI. And throughout my whole career, my focus has been mostly comedy. I felt like I was best um, equipped, and just the way I work is helping original uh, new voices and comedians and writers to transition to other places. So if I'm representing a playwright. Or a comedian, um, let's say a comedian. I, I've, I've worked with some um, uh, uh, comedians who have developed one-man shows and turned them into playwrights as as they transitioned. Um, I think that's you know that's for us you know, at least with man as managers go. I mean that's the most gratifying to help uh, pull a piece of talent from one area of expertise like their comfort zone and bring them into another space. Who else represents playwrights here? I mean, I represent quite a few. Um, that's that's sort of a, one of the bulk of my business, um, in addition to comedy. Uh, I have quite a few people that come from the theater, and I have for quite a long time. Um, and, uh, you know, specific, I guess, to the how we cross them over? Is that the question a little bit? You know, I think that um, what I look for, kind of like what Brian is saying, is it's all in the voice and the material and, you know, the perspective. and. Playwrights, you know, for me, I was just a big fan of theater. That's why I started working with a lot of playwrights early on. You know, I was drawn to that sort of work and plays and loved being able to see sort of a production and think about how that work could then translate into other mediums. You know, I'm always trying to think about how clients can work, you know, not only in one area, but in many areas. Um, and so, you know, a lot of it starts with thinking about for each person individually if the best step for them is to develop something, if it's to try and go on staff and get experience. I mean, I have people who were playwrights and got their own show on the air before staffing, and then I have people that, you know, the staffing route was much better for them. Um, so I think it's sitting down and really getting to know them and their work. Um, everybody's different in a room. Everybody's different in how they process ideas um, and, uh, and how that translates. So uh, that's, I guess, kind of basic. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I think there's so many playwrights in the city who want to be in TV, want to be in movies, and just don't know how. And I think that, for me, was what was really exciting about it, where I just kind of went around to all the theaters in town when I was getting into this and started talking to all their dramaturges about who they really liked, who they thought were up-and-comers, and I just got to read a whole bunch of playwrights, and I kind of compare it to like going to all the studios and saying, like, who are all the screenwriters that you're working with right now that you like? Because all these people were sort of doing good work in the theater, and interested in TV and movies, but they just didn't have an outlet for it. And either, you know, they had theater reps, but maybe they weren't didn't have someone working with them on the feature side or the TV side. And it was just about sort of getting to take someone who's already found success in one side of the writing industry and just transitioning them over. So since we're in New York, can we talk a little bit about the challenges of representing writers who live here in the city versus writers who might be in Los Angeles? I'll field that one first. Um, there are inherent challenges, of course. I think there's also a lot of opportunity. I mean, some of the challenges that, certainly for the film industry, to to the largest extent, the TV industry, a lot of it is based in Los Angeles. So, you know, if you have meetings that get moved around, if a writer has come to LA for a period of time, like it's a little harder to be flexible, and you have to cram everything into that sort of finite period that they're in Los Angeles. Um, I have found, though. To some degree, though, it's become an advantage because executives, producers that are coming through New York, as everyone does at some point, they will call managers and agents and say, I'm going to be in New York for three or four days. I want to meet a lot of writers. And, you know, a lot of times you can get that meeting set very quickly, whereas if it was in L.A., there'd be a million other things competing for their attention. So uh, I chose to, to use it as an opportunity, and I, I think it, it has been. Um, you know, a writer needs to sort of, at some point, Unless they're going to staff on a New York show, probably come to L.A. for a period of time, spend some time, get to make some relationships once they have something that people have read. Um, and after that, you know, I think it doesn't really matter where you are. 
So I don't think geography really is, uh, in today's world, I don't think it's, if people can Skype, they can do conference calls, I don't think it's a pejorative. I mean, for my business, I find a huge advantage being here. I've here my whole career, I mean, specifically for comedians, and writers coming, you know, out of, whether it's UCB or off of one of the late night shows, I mean, it's, it's, it's great here. Well, and writers aren't really, I feel like, as attuned to the industry here, and I look at that as a huge advantage because if they're not interested in the industry, they're more interested in do, just doing the work. I think people in L.A. too often get consumed by what's going on in the business, what someone's writing, oh, this just sold, like, should I do something this mindset, which that's, I feel like, our job to pay attention to, and they just need to focus on the writing. I want to introduce our... Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Notoriously late. <laughs> uh, Melissa Orton, ICM, TV scripted agent. I don't know anything else to add. <laughs> hobbies. What? Hobbies? <laughs> you don't have hobbies as an agent. <laughs> Spend all your time reading. Yeah. So you guys talked a little bit about late night. There are a lot more late night uh, staffing opportunities here in New York. Do you guys have any clients that you've staffed? Yes. Can you talk about that process? Um, the process has always been, I mean, the typical thing where we would say it's, it, I mean, it starts off with getting an email from an EP of the show we're looking to staff, and a lot of times it's uh, blind submissions. I mean, I think the, the greatest uh, one that I've uh, uh, seen over the past couple of years, I, I work with Samantha B. And their uh, submission process was completely blind. Any, fr any friends that came in, whatever it is, they would highlight the name and they would start from that. And whichever is the best rose to the top. And you look at that staff, and it's mo a lot of them are first-time writers, which is an amazing process and super fair. So that's, a that's true of a lot of the late night. You know, a lot of people come from other walks of life that end up getting on some of these late night shows. Um, I represent a lot of people that run a lot of these late night shows in New York. Um, and SNL is one of those shows where a lot of people tend to have connections. This year they kind of changed up the process a little bit and for the first time actually hired somebody that got through kind of a little bit blindly on a submission. Um, but you know, every show is a little bit different in how they do it. I represent the head writer of Stan B, which she represents Stan B, and, and also um, and head writer of, uh, of Last Week Tonight, which is John Oliver's show. Their process is a little bit different you know, on that. They actually, instead of just sending it out blindly, said, these are the criteria and then we'll invite you to submit. You know, Every single show is a little bit different in sort of their process and how people get on those stats. But I think you do see um, people that staff on those shows you know, maybe they were an uh, editor, or they came from the magazine world, they came from the newspaper world, and they ended up, you know, submitting in a different walk of life. So, you know. Well, they were, they were there like, were there a segment producer yeah. on one of those shows, and all of a sudden, they're on air talent, you know, so it's... So, television has changed a lot with all the streaming demand for content. How has that changed how you work with writers? Are there a lot more opportunities for staff to be writers because of that? Hopefully. Yeah, I think there's a ton of availability, more so than there ever was. I think you've got people coming from different areas, some people who write in a totally different medium that are given opportunities to be a part of the staff. But at the same time, I, mean, I, I, I haven't analyzed it that much, but you look at it, and aside from network television, look at all the shows on cable and streaming, it's hard to name 10 shows that suck. Think about it. It's hard to make. It's it's all good writing. So even though there's so many more opportunities and buyers, you put a list together of buyers that you go, we're going out to compared to ten years ago. I mean, it's fantastic. But there's you know it's very it's even so it's very competitive. So your voice has to be you know tremendously strong. So can you guys talk a little bit about how hands on you are with your clients as far as determining what they should write next? Do you give them some of their ideas? Do you listen to theirs? Uh, what, what's the process like for you individually? I'll, I'll start. Yeah. Um, you know, it really depends on, on the client, really. Some clients are very much self-generators. Some clients need sort of that extra little push. Um, they may need that source material, and you discuss that. Um, in general, I would think, of, as a rule, um, 
we if a client's writing something on spec, for instance, um, it would be rare for us to just wait for that to show up in the inbox and hope and pray it's the right thing in commercial. Like I think that would be a little lazy um, and and agent malpractice. Um, so you know, generally how it works if if a writer is thinking about what to write next, I want to write a spec, I want to write something outside the system. Um, usually the process will be we'll say like unless there's one idea that's a home run, um, talk to us about a couple ideas. We'll discuss pros and cons, which one the writer's most excited about. Um, but at a minimum, even if they have one idea, the writer may say, like, this is the thing I really want to write. Um, once in a while, we'll say, maybe that's, that's a mistake, but if you really need to go write it, like, go get that out of your system, and let's do our best to try to sell it. Um, a lot of times, you try to steer them towards the thing that is both makeable, commercial, and they're excited about, and hope that it checks all those boxes. But you don't want to just sit around and wait and because there could be something else that another writer has just sold and that writer doesn't know, and all of a sudden they've spent three months on something that there's two other projects in development. So you just want to avoid that. But we want to be hands on with our clients for sure. Yeah, I find a lot of it is unfortunately talking clients out of certain things. You know, they're putting a list together of four or five ideas, and it's like, as, as Jeff said, two of them is in development already. I say, listen, put that on the back burner. This is a great idea. Get rid of this idea. It's just it's not saleable, particularly with your employees. I mean, they're they're sometimes not comfortable in easy conversations. Um, but you know, we never send the clients off to hey, go write a script and come back to us. We have them beat out an outline, put a couple of paragraphs together, see if they're on the right path, and then you know, let them go from there. And a couple times you have to tell the writer like, I don't think this is going to help you to put this out in the marketplace. This is not your best work. And sometimes they understand and say. You're right. Let's let's start anew. And other times they say, "Can you just send it to a few of the friends of the courts and and sort of see if you're wrong?" And, but we'll or we'll never admit it. But sometimes we're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so how many people here already have representation? So a lot of you are looking for representation now. So I guess that's probably one of the big questions in the room is. How do I get representation? Do you guys recommend services like the blacklist as a way for a writer who's unknown and without representation to get someone to read their work? I feel like that's always been like a feature way to use your mic. I don't think, I don't it's, think it's on. Don't make hot of it before you have to hold it like this. You have to hold it like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, right, right, right. Right. <laughs> I do it like this, it doesn't work. I do it like this, okay. it works. Okay. Okay. I feel like the blacklist has always been more of like a feature way to get an agent. As far as TV, I mean, it's really, I feel like sometimes it's like making content, um, like making web, like just being out and about. There's writer programs you can be a part of. You know, applying to like the Warner Brothers program, like things that are like a little more traditional to break you into the system. Also, just moving to LA or being a part of a production. A lot of television is initially is breaking into just the relationships and getting to know the people who are involved. I think one thing is right. You know, it's, I'm always surprised when I meet writers or, or people that you know are like, I want to be a writer, and then I ask what they've written, and they've never written anything. <laughs> you know, it's it's like no, but, it, but that does happen quite often. You know, I don't know how many people in the room actually, you know, have you know is your material? What do you have? You know, what is in your arsenal? Like, what do you have to sort of provide? But it does come up quite often. You know, where I'll sit down with somebody and they say, Well, I want to be a television writer, but they haven't written a television spec. You know, so like as a writer, and I, I believe this for anybody that doesn't have representation to people that are working writers, you know, you should be constantly working and perfecting your, cra your craft and adding to it. And, you know, for me, you know, it's a great voice. You know, I have to read something to decide that I want to, you know, take that person on and work with somebody, you know, and, and see something really original and see something that I really respond to. Um, because that ultimately helps me do my job. Um, you know, just getting on a staff or getting a job is not really, in my, it just, and everybody's very different, but that, that is really not enough. It has to be sort of like, this is who I am, this is what speaks to me, and this is my voice. Um, so I think, like, working on your material, 
um, and getting it in front of people. You know, if you, you know, I think as Melissa said, like if you're working on a production and uh, you're in a writer's room or your writer's assistant, you have the opportunity for the showrunner to read your pilot or, you know, you meet somebody that like can be in a advantage to you in that way or get in front of the right people that's all that's helpful but I also think like this is this is an era where creators are coming from everywhere you know and we can find somebody whether it's a playwright and that's what you do as your craft and you get an opportunity to see that production and it carries on or you put up a web video you know and you're doing a short you know and that sort of grows or you are really funny on Twitter, and that sort of grows a profile for you. So I think that there's endless mediums to being able to get your content out there and think about how you can make it distinctive and different um, than everybody else and show your voice. You just keep generating it. I mean, you know, I feel like a lot of times writers write something and then they want everybody in town to read it, and if they're not getting the responses that they want, you got to write something else. And I just think it's that idea of the Andrew Stanton mentality of fail quickly. And just, you know, it's just you keep, you know, something didn't work in the way you thought it would or you thought this was brilliant, but people didn't see it that way. Write something else to make them pay attention, and then they'll see that that first thing after they've re responded to the second thing. Do you guys pay attention to contest winners? Truth. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. Not, 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 it's good to know the truth. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Um, it's just, I would... I basically put a lot more stock in a manager or a lawyer or a client referring a client saying, this is great, you must read this, than a contest winner. It's, it's just the truth. Yeah, it's very rare to slip through. I mean, I, I wouldn't say don't do it because I think that can, again, I think that can help you with your craft and I think get you in front of people. And a lot of those festivals, a lot of the TV festivals, for example, you have the opportunity to meet networks or you have the opportunity to meet you know, a showrunner or somebody that might be speaking on a panel or something like that. It is it is less the way, yes, that I personally would, you know, pay attention to somebody. But, you know, I also, I just started with somebody that had a film that she made herself that ended up at a festival, you know, and I wouldn't have told her not to do that. Like, you know, it, it ended up at Tribeca, and, and that was an original piece of content and voice. And so, you know, I, I think that it's good to do those things to, to practice and you know some there are people that go out and look for material specifically um, at those places I do less of it but but some people do I think we're going to open it up to the audience for some questions over here yeah. yes okay um, I love that you all mentioned the word voice and I'd love to know what each of you, if you can articulate, what speaks to you um, in terms of voice and what kind of excites you. I mean, it's sort of ineffable, but I think, I mean, to some degree, it's something that keeps you turning the page. It's an ability to surprise you, uh, to entertain you. I think you have to put yourself in the shoes of an audience down the road, be it a TV show, a play, a, a movie, and think like, is this interesting? Is this sort of turning a, a, a trope on its head and being surprising? <clears throat> um, like, it's great to have a completely original voice, so something that's just so singular that you've never seen that before, and that's great. Those those voices are, are precious and wonderful. I think you also have to think like, can this person, uh, you know, be on the staff of a show, uh, write uh, some sort of a tentpole movie? Um, voice can be a, a part of that. You don't want really to lose that. But I think, you know, the bottom line is, you know, are you surprised and do you want to keep reading? I mean, that, that's how I do it. I don't know how I, another way to articulate it, really. I was going to say, I feel like it's always very specific to taste, yeah. too. You know, like, I work with people who are very much in, interested in representing people who play in the graphic novel world. That's not my cup of tea. I a lot of times can't even understand it when I'm watching it. You know, so it's really, it's, it's so specific to each agent, and that's got to also align, you, you want to have an agent who kind of understands your voice. Right. Yes. Hi. I have a script that I sold, a sci-fi space thriller that I sold to a studio back when I had a manager. Now I don't. And I've been told that the script has been put to a turnaround. So is it acceptable for me to be pitching this or talking about it to agents or to other studios in order to drum up interest or am I supposed to take a hands-off on this or 
Well, you're pitching them for, for what reason? To get representation again? To try to get a second life on the project? So yes. The, the, the latter? Oh. Um, it would, I would have to... The truth is, there could be a reversion on your script after a period of time with cost against mm -hmm. it, whatever they whatever they spent. You should have someone look into that. How long ago did you write it? Yeah. Uh, it sold in 2014. They'll, they'll still we'll control it for a while, I mean, five to seven years, depending on probably what was in there. Um, but, but yes, you can you can certainly talk to people about it. I just think you have to, with the caveat of saying it's set up at Fox or Paramount or whoever it may be. Fox, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would use that as a sample. I mean, if you're really yeah. proud of it, and that is, is that your voice? Like, do you look at that as like this is the best thing I've ever written? Or well, it's I, unfortunately, if it's a sci-fi space thriller and everything else I've written is comedy, so <laughs> that, that's kind of a right. Well, that's tricky. I mean, if you, if you feel like you're not going to have something that's going to follow up in that genre, that might not be the best script to send out. Yeah, I mean, you could say, look, you, you've sold something. That's something that you know, yeah, a lot of writers can, they can't say that. So that's, that's great. But if, yes, if you want to be a comedy writer, you can certainly mention to someone, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I've set something up, but this is not who I am. I just did it to have a sale. And you should probably write something that's original, that's truer to where you want to be going as a writer. Yes, I did just two things. Do you guys mind going down the line with the names again? Because um, with their names, everybody's names. Oh, sure. <laughs> Jeff Morley. Jeff Morley. Yes. Brian Stern. Brian Stern. Darren Junkin. What is it? Darren Junkin. Jack Greenbaum. Melissa Orton. Thank you. And then the second question. Um, do you guys feel like, um, as far as being attracted to like contemporary stuff that's happening like in comedy, because I'm a comedy writer too, so, you know, like as far as focusing on ethnic humor or, you know, immigrant <clears throat> stories or LGBT <clears throat> stuff, you know, stuff that's like people are addressing more nowadays than they did 30 years ago. Is that a thing that you guys do, or is it just whatever's good? Yes, but it's got to be unique to who you are. Like, if you're writing something ethnic, you have to, you know, if your significant other is African-American, or you grew up in a, you know, culturally diverse neighborhood, and, you know, it's got to be authentic. If you're just writing it for the sake of, it feels like a network could use this, or I feel like I could, you know, write something like trans, you know, be a staff writer on Transparent, even though I'm not that... You know, familiar with right. with the show or or uh, um, that community, it's tricky. So, it's, <clears throat> yeah, don't fake it. You know, so it's got to be real to who you are. But how many of you guys are interested in being staffed on the show? Is that, that's your goal? Oh, a lot of people on the run. Okay, can can we get some advice for writers who don't have representation, whose goal is to be staffed? What can they be doing? in the absence of having representation to prepare for the opportunities. <laughs> getting a job as a writer's assistant in LA. If you're here in New York. Assistant, uh, you know, as well as the programs, you know, Warner Bros. program, Mesa Studios program, uh, you know, one of those programs are tremendously helpful. I mean, the truth of the matter is, like most of the network staff jobs, at least at that sort of entry level, come from one of those programs in the network space. And, you know, many more of them come from internal promotions. You know, somebody that is promoting their assistant or, you know, bringing in somebody from a program with this diversity or whatever it may be. Um, oh, that's just a common, you know, way to staff shows sort of at the level of, at this point. So I think, again, like working on a production, working as a writer's assistant, um, and networking sort of that way uh, is helpful. Yes. Given the tentpole mentality in Hollywood, how robust is the spec screenplay market these days? I guess I'll feel that one. <laughs> 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 feature person. The outpost here. Um, it's certainly different than it was 10 years ago where you had people whose job it basically was in the development sector to read specs overnight and try to bid on them. So it's not the greatest way to set up a movie um, for multiple reasons. Um, having said that, we still encourage writers to do it um, because you need something to be able to, to show people. I think what, what we've done um, 
and what I found is helpful. And people like don't know what to write. They want to break in. They want to be a studio writer. But the barrier to entry is, is tricky. They're the same people writing Spider-Man and all these kind of movies. Um, and maybe you may not want to write that anyway. But what I've noticed is that people are reading specs. They're not necessarily selling, but their scripts, they get, if in the right circumstances, they get noticed. And that writer then has a voice. People can see what they've done on the page. They'll go to a round of meetings. Something inevitably will come of that, some sort of job. It may not be the sale of the script, or maybe that sale, maybe the script gets on the blacklist, as we were talking about, and then all of a sudden, some entrepreneurial producer six months later will say, like, oh, is that, is that still available? I, that was always a great script. Um, <clears throat> so there is a way to do it. I think in terms of what to write, the one sort of, if there's any sort of thing about what that advice would be, and what I've noticed is usually people, and execs are responding to movies and scripts that sort of have a, a historical bent. Not, they're not, meaning that they're about something or somebody that we all sort of kind of know, but there's sort of a dimension to that that you didn't realize you didn't know all the story. Like, the imitation game, I guess, would be sort of a successful sort of version of that, and, and that writer went on to do a lot of different things that just beyond it, a historical thing. Um, I, I, I've had a lot of success recently, and and a couple of one about sort of a Hollywood movie, um, about sort of an actor that we all know historically, and something from the 19th century. Now that doesn't sound overly commercial, but there was something about it that everyone thought, oh, that's that's interesting. I didn't know that that existed. Um, and it got a lot of people to pay attention, and now that script is sold, and and that writer's on his way. So um, it's almost a tail wagging the dog at a certain point in terms of spec of selling for $300 million, you know, $100 million or whatever, a million dollars overnight, that doesn't happen. But, you know, you're not going to get a job as a writer without something to show. So I still think it's valuable. And question. I just think the thing to think about is a little bit broader than just a historical perspective. It's more like, you have to imagine an executive sitting on a Saturday morning with 10 scripts to read. And I really think, picture this, because this is what's going to happen to your script, whether it's an agent, a manager, or an executive. And that they have ten, nine other things that they really have to read, whether it's a project or you know, a writer's mission or whatever. But you want to make yours the thing that they want to read. Right. Because people will prioritize that. If it sounds something like a piece of history that they didn't know about or they thought they knew, or a character that they're really compelled by, like that's what people get excited about, is something that they want to see that movie in their head. And then hopefully they want to see it on the screen. And I found that they reach for the thing that they at least have some hook. They're like, I've heard of this. Let me read it, as opposed to... This writer I've never heard of, his sort of sci-fi trilogy. Um, like that, that seems daunting on a Saturday morning. <laughs> yes. Um, in terms of spec samples to have, is it worth it to have a spec of an existing TV show, or is it just better to have a pilot of your own? You're looking to be staffed. Or yeah, what? like staffed, or just to get read. Because is it even worth having a? Existing. Yeah, I don't think you can talk more of this. I, for me, I, I don't want. Uh, I, mean, yeah. I like. Original. I don't think you need this. I mean, I maybe. Agree. Look, you'll you'll run across some old school showrunners, especially in comedy. Once in a while, they're like, would love to see a spec episode because, especially in the comedy space, you know, on a more traditional sort of sitcom or something like that, they may ask for it. But they're still going to want to read the original piece, like very rarely. You know, if that helps you like work it out and figure out, you know, how to mimic a voice and write a television episode. But, you know, it's, it's, it's like what we're saying about material. Like, if I'm going to a stack and somebody wrote a spec episode or something, that's going to the bottom of my pile. <laughs> you know, I'd much rather read all the stuff that's original. Before but if, you had, if you've written something original and it's great, and you follow up with, you know, Big Bang Theory spec, and yeah. look, it'll be like, and, he's, and it's good, that helps. It's also hard, too, because not a lot of people watch one show anymore. You know, there isn't that... Yeah. Like, it was so obvious years ago, it was like, either, what was it, um... Curve. Friends, or like yeah, or Friends. Like there isn't that obvious show that everyone's watching. So it's kind of if you have a spec of a show that's on the air that you love, but the execs like, I don't even know that. If I read right. it, I'm not sure if he did or could mimic the voice. That's the tricky part. I, yeah. I once read a spec. I once read a script. It was like, All in the Family. <laughs> this was like from five years ago. <laughs> and got, with the characters, but he, it was had nothing to do with the show. Just the characters, yeah. and it was funny. I mean, it was well, one of my favorite yeah. ones I ever read was Larry David 
versus Jack Bauer. <laughs> right. And it, it, it blew up, you know, his staffing experience that year. I think he met on every show. Yeah, there, like, there was hour, tw I read one that was like hour 25, you know, 24. I mean, like that, I mean, it really That's can funny. mix things up. Yeah. And Some it's of interesting, you know. Where they all get HIV, and there's a where We actually had to close the spec part of Big Break because the judges wanted to know what else the winners had, and they weren't interested in, in the specs. So I think having original material is extremely important. Um, yeah, this is to change the perspective of everyone out here. Why is it that people always assume that writers could work in like one genre, one area? Like this man here who just said that he has a sci-fi script and has comedy. I mean, I've done outrageous comedy that has literally made Howard Stern cringe, and I've done 9-11 songs that have had rooms full of 500 people in tears, and I've done a wide range in between. I mean, some people actually work in a lot of different, you know, styles, depending on what they're working on. The same way a lot of musicians I know work in, could play 10 different instruments and do them all well. And there's always an assumption among agents managers that if this is what you're showing me this is the limit of your work i think there's always the opportunity that writers could have many talents but it's up to the individual uh, yeah I, I also don't yeah and I, I think that i i hope that people have capability to sort of go every place and that's what i'm always trying to look at you know i think when you have a client that's successful in one area it's like how can we build it out i think what it is is what is the narrative for you? You know, what is the story for you and what is the starting place? And it may be confusing to the buyers, quite honestly, or to people if you say, I write genre, but I also write really laugh out loud comedy. You know, it's like, what are you? Are you a comedy writer? Are you a genre writer? What is it, you know, that you are? Right, but when you're starting, and it depends. I'm saying, like, for people start, if you're starting out, you know, if that's really the question, Dig into like what you're great at and lean into that. And once you have a hit comedy on the air, well then jump to go do that drama or go write that drama, you know, or you know, write on a comedy show but spec out a drama, you know, that's a that's a, a screenplay or something like that. You can do it and you can build upon it. But I think it's when maybe you hear from agents or managers, like we are trying to help expand your career in a way that we can articulate well and sell well to the entertainment community, you know, and to you. And so it's a little bit about, like, how we put together all those tools that you have, a little bit. Not that you can't. And you're a writer. You, you could write yourself out of any box yep. that the town wants to try to put you in, but you have to have success initially because there are execs that sit there and they have, they have genre lists. And, like, when they're trying to fill up a writing assignment... They're putting, you know, so-and-so on the comedy list or the thriller list. And the goal is to have such a successful career as a writer, they don't really know where to put you. But that's that's a negative at first because then they don't put you anywhere. So that's it's a way to kind of transcend that. Yes. Um, yeah, I have a question about what should be sort of your expectation of your representation um, in terms of like, you know, like I guess kind of, when is it time to sort of move on from them to somebody else? <laughs> um, or if not, or if not returning your calls yeah. in an hour. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. You need honesty from your reps. You need right. to be able to, to hear bad news and good news as well. Um, and yeah, the, the, the baseline is a return phone call, of course. But someone is excited about, you know, helping you and having a plan for you and sending your material out. And, you know, I mean, I think if you're not getting that, then yes, there's, there's a big problem. If they say to you, I don't talk to you, but I talk about you, run. <laughs> Can we turn that question around and ask uh, what you guys expect from your clients? Yeah. I think it's going back to what Aaron said. You've got to continue writing. You have to keep producing. It's very hard to represent someone who is trolling around with the same script for five years saying, why haven't we sold this? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm like the opposite. I spent 20 years in L.A., and I worked a lot. I have 20 years of nonstop writing for television, producing series, uh, creating series, did a lot of work with Bernie Brillstein. 
And uh, around 2005, I was like, oh, wow, you know, there, the pen poles were starting. And I, this isn't the stuff I write. So I said, okay, here's my chance to come back to New York and write theater, which I'm doing now. But now I'm like, okay, now I have this TV pilot, which actually won the West Coast Writers Guild Diversity Award like three years ago. And I'm like, okay, now who's going to read this? Because I'm doing theater and I'm writing musicals. And I'm like, I'm, I feel like, like I don't know where to go to get people to read stuff because you can't just pick up the phone and call you, Taylor William Morris, and say, hi, I'm this, because I was a CAA for 20 years. And then once my agents started leading for other things, the new people coming in didn't really know you anymore. And so you, you feel kind of like, well, but I was there 20 years. I probably paid your rent. You know? <laughs> and so, so how does a person like me, who, who has been doing it for basically 30 years, get someone to actually like, so, oh, you know what you're doing. Read, I'll read your stuff. That's the thing. <laughs> it's like, so what is it? So you have the musical that you put up that's... But that's starting the workshop in September. I have a I have a festival musical coming in three weeks. So the I'm, 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 the, the musical. So I'm into the TV stuff also. So I actually want to get this pilot done. I mean, I think there's a lot of people who read material, and it's just like it's about figuring out who reads unrepresented writers, who are the who are the managers or agents that you're interested in, sort of targeting them. I think so much people think of agents and managers as the enemy, and they stop seeing them as people. And it's this idea: well, who is it that they're representing? What type of material are they going out with? And just, it's, you know, I feel like you send an email, you make a phone call, and you have a conversation with them about, oh, hey, here's this, here's what I have going on. Like, yeah, a lot of people are going to say no, but there will be some people who say yes. And it's just, it, it is pounding the pavement in that way. It's really hard to read unsolicited material, you know, just because there are so many people out there. Um, so I think it's going back to those relationships. Like, if you had a lawyer then, you know, that still has strong industry relationships, or relationships with lawyers or managers now, right, that is willing to sort of also make a call on your behalf, those sorts of people going back to that well of, of people, I think is also helpful. Yeah, dig into your Rolodex. I mean, I mean yeah. there's, there's, I'm sure there's somebody in there that a representative would take seriously um, you know, to say, look, you should read this. I think you mentioned you were knocking on doors like ICM, CAA. You're knocking on big, heavy doors. There are some opportunities with smaller managers who are hungry for material. Mm -hmm. that if you dig a little deeper, they might be interested in reading. I actually prefer a manager at this point because I'm doing so many different things. I would like to actually have some. So maybe yeah. change your target. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was, uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the business side, like maybe the terms that you get involved with somebody, a new, a new writer, for instance, is it, is it yearly, is it, and if they're a writer-director, are you representing them exclusively on the writing, can that open up into different things, and then as far as the actual business, do the checks go to you, do they go to them, are they paying the commission, like I'd love to know more about that, that you don't often actually... You know, we represent, I represent people across the board. So, you know, if we come in, then it's across the board. Um, and the checks go to us or the business manager or whoever, but we take a commission. Um, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, like, I guess, there is, like, each agency has their own accounting department. Those people kind of break down. They let us know when the money gets in the door as the, as the representative. <clears throat> They're open yeah. till Christmas Eve or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They really do. They're all Trust me, somebody needed it today. Yeah. 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 yeah, they're also the meanest people in the building. <laughs> <laughs> Every agent is always hounding them that where's the money, where's the money? You know, because you want to make sure your clients get it on time. And you said term? Uh, uh, what was yeah, question? like, is it annually? Like, do you sign no, somebody for a year or do you say six months? Or hopefully, when you sign someone, you're representing them for, you know, the duration of the career. There's no. Well, I mean, some agencies, I mean, I'm not sure who does what anymore, but as far as it used to be, all agencies, they have agency papers and you have to sign an agreement. I know some of the smaller agencies still have that. I don't believe all the big agencies do that as far as. When I was at uh, Brillstein and what we do, it's it's a handshake. And if you're not happy at any point, you can walk away. But you know, we expect to be uh, we expect to be protected, so to speak, on um, anything that we've helped you prior to that. 
um, on commission. But you know, it's just just to follow up with that, is that your exclusive decision, or are you conferring with a colleague? Is it? No, I mean that's that's our company policy. That's a lot of that's company basically policy. everywhere. I mean, look, yeah, it's, right. it's, it's, it's it's papers or not. You know, it's like if you don't want to be with that, you know, with your agent, then you should be allowed to leave. You know. Um, What's protected under that, as Brian said, and the work that you did, you know, is the work that you did, and that would be something you, you know, potentially pay commission on. But if, if you know, the it's as long as you want to be there, and it's a mutual relationship, right? Um, and as you said, like a writer or a director, back to you know, he's saying across the board, it's like if you want to be a writer and build into a director, well, then let's do that too. You know, it's it's sort of should be a fruitful relationship in all areas. It would be a strange agent-client relationship if you were a writer and said, I want to be a director, and the agent said, well, I'm only going to represent you for writing. I don't think you'd represent that client very long. So it's definitely across the board. I'd be curious. I mean, I have, I have management, and I'd be curious to know what you guys, because I still don't know after like three years the real difference between management and an agent. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's totally that's a honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Managers, agents steal clients from other agencies. <laughs> 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 well, I know, but, but you can answer because you've been both. So you can maybe tell us. You know, <laughs> agents wear ties. I still don't know the real difference. I mean, look, well, I, I don't know, I'm just kidding. But, I mean, look, I, typically speaking, the agent's there to negotiate the deal. Open up the doors. The manager's really there to set up set up a strategy and really go through your goals, where you want to be in six months to a year, and help you find an agent, find an attorney, set up the whole team, right. and be there as and as some managers as I do is somewhat of a creative partner. I mean, I'm not a writer, but really hands on, and that's why we produce as well with our clients. We protect our clients when they sell a show or a feature. And, and um, but, you know, it's, the lines blur. I mean, you know, I've seen plenty of agents. I mean, when, when I was an agent, I, I actually felt like a manager within an agency. I was the one that put teams together. I was very nurturing with my clients. But, you know, I, I see some agents that act as managers where they give the notes and they're on the phone with their clients more than managers. So, <laughs> Yes, yeah, it's, it's very amorphous. I mean, it's, I know, I can understand why it's confusing. And it kind of goes back to the subjective relationship that a client has with their representation. Some some clients want to talk to multiple people all day long about the same things. Um, <laughs> others just want to talk to one person totally, and that's it. Um, and so it, there are moments where a manager can be acting very much like an agent and vice versa. I think it just goes down to the sort of the style of representation and, and client that, that you want to be. Okay. Yeah. I uh, have... Uh, written a fictional adaptation of a documentary I produced in Rome. I found two major movie stars who are interested in it, but I cannot send them the script because I don't have an agent. It has to be agent to agent. Licensed California or New York agent. Who's interested? Which <laughs> actors are interested? Um, which actors are interested? I'm not going to say okay. that. And it was a personal relationship? That I met them personally. And they said they were interested one said, not only he's interested, he wants to be considered to play the lead. And the other said, please send me the script, sounds interesting. And, then, and have you contacted that, that, uh, that I actor's tried, agent? I, I tried to. Letters returned, scripts returned, no access, has to go through an agent. How do I get that agent? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that everyone's question? <laughs> Well, I, I think we've kind of been answering that, though, throughout the panel. It's been about networking and getting your script out there and having content. Is that the only script that you've written? No, I've written a few others. The only one I'm pushing right now. Okay. And I have not pushed the others. I think you might want to send maybe some query letters to the smaller agencies or management companies and tell them about your situation and your idea and that you need help contacting an interested actor. I mean, I actually have a question for the room. Has anyone had success sending a blind submission query letter to an agent or manager? Yeah. And, and you got representation off that? No, but the problem, <laughs> the, the, the problem is that they're, they're not signatory. Like, if you deal with the bigger guys, they, they want a signatory. And I learned this because I'm also a director. They want a, they want a signatory agency. But in his case, I would, I would get a lawyer to submit it. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I will say it's tough. I, we, we all get tons of these emails, unsolicited emails, and they go unreturned. First of all, it's not referred to us, but it's very generic. I get it and I read it, and I'm, my assumption, and I'm mostly always right, is that everyone here on Gun got it on the panel and all the other agencies and such. So if you are reaching out, and again, most agents and managers do not take on solicited material, but try to make it as personal as possible and make it seem like it's, you know, you know who that representative is, what they specialize in, and send it that way. Because I, I hear from so many people, no one responds to my, our emails, and it's, they look like blanket generic emails. So. And, you know, I mean, and managers, I think, are probably a little more entrepreneurial about the clients they'll take on. I'd also... The friendly assistants, you know, they're they're looking to get promoted. They're looking to prove themselves. If they read something that's great, you know, chances are they're going to talk to their boss and say, "Hey, on on the slush pile, I read this was amazing over the weekend. You really should take it seriously." Like, that's the most enterprising assistants are doing that and should. Uh, I got a wrong number once. Got an agent got that years ago. Someone went <laughs> an independent agency oh that was God. pretty well known at the time. And I was calling someone else with that name. And Just position said, material. <laughs> and I, she said, "Well, I'm not this this one, but I'm also not the accountant, and I'm also not this one." And I said, "Well, twenty years." She said, "The agent." I said, "Well, I'm actually looking for an agent too." We started talking, and yeah, I well. I had a, a I'm a I'm a playwright. I had a play agent reject my play because she, she didn't know what to do with it and then I got a production uh, and a, a, you know we had a subscription theater where they had subscribers so it was a nice contract and then I got in touch with the agent again <laughs> and things then you know so then I, did get, I did get that agent so because I showed that I could right. produce it so we got a question from social media. Um, after an agent or manager requests your script, <laughs> after an agent or manager requests your script, how long after sending it should the writer follow up? Not the next day. <laughs> a week or two. Yeah. Two, week or two? Two, two weeks. weeks. Two, two weeks. Two weeks. Right. Yeah, two, two weeks. Couple weekends in there. You know, is good. But a follow-up is appropriate. Yes, yeah. Uh, honestly, follow-up's good. I, I you know, yeah. you get stuff I don't remember sometimes. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not going to, like, <laughs> it's, it's good. It's like, oh, thank you for following up. You know, if it's not on the forefront, it's something that's submitted, and it's, you know, it's good. Yeah, what's um, what's your involvement generally when you have a client who's interested in adapting material, whether it's from a New York Times article or a short story or something? Does it generally fall on the writer to acquire the rights first, or is it something that the agencies get involved in on their behalf? How does that usually work? We we do. We have a rights search department, and we'll do the rights search and help acquire. You know. In terms of like are the fees, or you're saying like track down, or well, even even just reaching out and contact. Yeah, no, source, well, we example. we do that. Mm -hmm. do that. Very beleaguered rights check department. It's <laughs> always looking at uh, book options yeah. and articles and things like that. But so. if you can't get it to an if you're not with a big agency that does that, then, then it's mostly attorneys that can help. Right, mm -hmm. and charge our way around. Right. Hi, how you doing? Happy to be here. Um, happy to ask this question. Um, it's kind of a simple question. I write features. Um, I got some success with one of my features that got distributed and all that. But um, how likely, who, who deals with features on the, I'm sorry. I do. You do? <laughs> okay, great. So um, how likely is it that you get a feature that you push and that feature actually gets produced for someone that you've just started working with, maybe some a writer that's not named yet that no one knows but um i, I just want to know because i think that's I, that's my goal and i think that's a lot of people's goal but like how likely is it i've well, never really let me, let me understand the question how likely is it that someone will take on a, a client or that to, yeah you take some... on well you like the script so you, you i guess you take on the client and then um you believe in the script and you push the script and the script actually gets you know produced and made like how I mean, the percentages of things that get made are depressingly low, um, unfortunately, <laughs> just the nature of the business. Um, 
you know, I don't know what the actual percentage is, but the ratio of, you know, things that go unsold to set up, option, purchase, whatever, and then actually made, I mean, it's it's a narrowing margin. So, you know, the, the margins are not great. Um, it, it doesn't stop agents from signing people because we believe in something. And the truth is, you just never know where it's going to come from. You know, there are things that you think are surefire sales that you're wrong about, and there are things that you just, you know, think seem very tough, and all of a sudden those are the things that kind of fall in place. So uh, it's maybe not an answer to your question, but, I mean, it's, look, the odds are obviously against you, but it's we're all here because we, you know, love this and believe in the ability of, of us to help writers and directors turn their words into actual, you know, action. So, you know, I mean, does that answer your question? I hope, I hope that does a little it's bit. It's good to get that perspective perspective from an agent, you know, to just hear that real, you know, because I, I feel like that's what I want to do. And I, I tell people that and I, in my brain, it's so easy and seems so simple <laughs> when I get that right product, you know, to, to just give it to the right person. I, I think the question for you is, do you want representation for your script or for you as a writer and your career? So, yeah, I didn't know there was a difference between having representation for a script and as a writer. I your rep, your rep is representing you. Right. And the one thing I would just say is, you know, as the movie business, you know, I, I, I don't believe in the doom and gloom of the movie business, but it's certainly gotten more challenging and harder. And the one thing I would say is, you know, if if you are a feature writer, you think of yourself as that. Think of yourself as a television writer as well. There's no reason not to do both. The, the, the exponential growth in buyers in the television sector has been great. Um, it's certainly shrunk to some degree in the film industry. So, you know, a lot of writers are, are going to television. Um, a lot more than they were before. So, you know, the goal is to get your work on screen. If we have time, just a couple more questions. Okay. My goal is to get a staff writing job on a late night talk show. And I've written for comedy and news and all sorts of other things. How do I attract an agent to just let me know when those openings are, submit my material? You know, what sort of things would I I would do the research of you want to write in New York or LA or it doesn't matter. Preferably New York, but yeah. So it's find out and it's not hard. I mean, you already know the names of two people who are in that space. As far as um, reaching out to the agents that and managers mm -hmm. that are specifically in that area, mm -hmm. and you know, if you've written, have you written any? Uh, I've been on staff at various cable shows, right? Or morning shows. So for any of the late night shows, so it's you know, there's a, bit, there's a difference between SNL. And Seth Meyers in the sense yep. of, you know, are you a sketch person? Are you better adapted to writing on yeah. Weekend Update or a monologue? So I would start sending out some of these jokes, monologue jokes, mm -hmm. and make it kind of evergreen. Like if it's outdated, I wouldn't send those. And you can start with that. And, you know, if, if they're really good and you have a list of like nine or ten comedy reps in New York, yeah. someone's going to bite and say, hey, Here's a submission for a show that I've seen. I can represent you yet, but if you want to submit, I'm happy to put it through for you. You get a gig, you might get an agent that way. Right, thank you. Can you yeah, you were talking about making transitions, uh, especially in the realm of comedy, but can you talk about anybody, experiences you've had dealing with people who make transitions from the world of nonfiction into the world of fiction? Um, uh, for example, limited series television or whatever experiences you might have had, and how that's worked. And transitioning into being like a screenwriter or TV writer? I'm sorry, I missed the first part. From nonfiction writing, like authoring, exactly into like feature and TV exactly. writing. I still think it's about the material, right? It's like, what's your TV pilot look like? What's I'm not asking, I'm saying, have you guys had experience doing that, and if so, what was the experience like? Yeah, I mean, I think I had a lot of experience with people who write memoirs. I think that's a really interesting and fertile place that really shows a voice, but Sure, certainly, like people have also written just like interesting historical nonfiction. Again, it's about what they're interested in doing in the TV or feature landscape. Time for one more. Uh, you had mentioned earlier about you know wanting a script that was a page turner that gets you guys excited. If you're looking to represent a writer, how many scripts is the right number of scripts that makes you feel confident? Is it two page turn or two scripts that are page turners? Three, four. It could be anything from you know, say a movie to a TV show or a sketch. What? If it's that good, it could be one. 
Yeah, just one. I think what is it? I think it's William Goldman who said that like the two most important things are the first twenty pages of a script and the last twenty minutes of a movie. And I think that for me is you know it's, I think it's hard sometimes for writers to remember that because they're thinking about their big ending and like this whole over that they've sort of crafted. But it's really about are you going to keep me reading? And am I going to be engaged through the whole thing? And because I'm also thinking, will other people in the industry be engaged in reading? Because then I have to take this on and sell it uphill. Mm -hmm. All right, we've gone over a little bit, but you guys had some great questions. Thank you so much, and thank you, panelists.